Batista, who is on the, she's the one you don't, the face you don't see. She is uh, making sure everything runs good for us technically wise. So Sharice will be letting us know what questions and comments you guys have coming in. And we'll get to those the, uh, the best that we can. Uh, give me just a second. We also have, for you that are joining us on Zoom, our Facebook audience can now join us as well. So uh, hello, everybody on Facebook. Welcome to We Are Listening. Uh, again, make sure you have your video off, your microphone off, and on your video settings, you want to hide non-video participants. Uh, again, thank you guys for joining us. A great conversation comes tonight. I want to take just a couple of moments while people are coming into the room uh, to make a couple of announcements. I have a couple of announcements as far as for San Diego Repertory Theater, just some virtual things that we have going on for you. I want to remind you that right now, now, now showing is a weekend with Pablo Picasso, with my man Herbert Siguenza. It's a one-man show. It's, I saw it live when we did it here live at the Rep. It's been all over the place, but I, can only, I haven't been able to watch the movie yet, but I know it's a spectacular, spectacular uh, viewing experience. Uh, you can get your tickets now at sdrep.org. It is showing through October 14th. So head on over to uh, sdrep.org and grab your tickets for We Are Listening, I mean for uh, for a weekend Pablo Picasso and um, we are also right now giving you a chance to see Get Happy. It's an Emmy award winning performance by Angela Ingersoll celebrating uh, Julie Garland. So make sure you get your tickets and check that out as well at sdrep.org. Um, before I move any further, Jacole, do you have any announcements you want to make before we get into our conversation tonight? Just want to make sure that everybody knows that we have the ongoing digital WOW series going at La Jolla Playhouse. There is just amazing projects that are going on. Uh, Portaleza, a partnership with David Reynoso. You can still see some of the totally fake Latino news featuring San Diego Rep's own uh, Herbert Seguenza and Culture Class. Lots of great offerings in our digital WOW. La Jolla we can't hear you okay i just i think the audio i broke up a minute so i just want to make sure you were good i'm good okay as as many of you know this is this is what our world is reduced to right this is what our zoom lives have been reduced to at work and school and everything the catching up on audio and all that good stuff uh so again make sure um you visit our respective websites and check out all the information all these spectacular shows Again, we are listening now a partnership with San Diego Repertory Theater, La Jolla Playhouse, and the Old Globe, Jacole Kitchen, and as well as Freedom Bradley Valentine, our uh, Associate Artistic Director and Director of Arts Engagement at the Old Globe. And myself, we are curating guests for this show. Just want to remind you, coming up on October 8th, we will have the spectacular Carol Foreman joining us here on We Are Listening. And on October 29th, We'll have actors from San Diego Repertory Theater production of JQA. But let's get into tonight's guest. This is kind of like a, this is kind of like the administrative special of We Are Listening Tonight. Uh, everyone who will be talking tonight right now works on the administrative end in the performing arts. And I'm going to ask my guests to go ahead and magically make themselves appear on camera. I would like to introduce to you. Nikki Cooper, the Director of Patron Experience at the McCarter Center, uh, McCarter Theater Center, and also Mark Sharp, Director of Operations at the New Brunswick Performing Arts Center. What's up, y'all? Hey there. How y'all doing? Good. How you doing? We're good. Good. We're good. Thank you guys for joining us tonight. I really appreciate it. I know we're going to have a, uh, I know we're going to have a fun conversation, but a real one. <laughs> And, you know, like I always say, anybody can read a bio, but I really like you guys to introduce yourselves to the audience to give us kind of a brief synopsis of how you got into this performing arts world. And uh, I'll start with you, Nikki. Um, so I knew early on that I wanted to work in arts and entertainment because both of my grandmothers worked in the industry um, in more of a service position. Um, so it made sense for me. I started in uh, video and as we know, video died. And so then I transitioned over to working in the arts. Um, and here I am. Nice. 
Mr. Sharp. Ah, good after evening. Um, I have been a lover of the arts probably since I was in the sixth grade. Um, I started, I was singing and working backstage in theater productions probably from the time I was in the sixth grade. And when I was in the eighth grade, um, I was fortunate to go, I grew up in a tiny little town called Highland Park, New Jersey. And we had probably one of the most active theater departments in New Jersey. And uh, in my eighth grade year, we did a production of West Side Story, which changed the whole course of my, the rest of my life. And working in the performing arts is all that I've ever wanted to do since then. Well, thank you very much, you guys. We appreciate it. I know our audience appreciates it. Um, you know, kind of the frame, as we've been talking about, you know, when we started doing this, we kind of didn't really know what it would be. It really just started as we just wanted to do something to where, you know, because of our current situation that has exploded upon us this year and the heightened racial tensions and conversations that were already happening in performing arts about representation and equity. Um, you know, I think Sam just wanted to be kind of just a thing where we just got an idea of what, you know, black theater professionals thought. And I mean, that still is what it is, but I think it's, it's really bloomed into something uh, even more beautiful. I think it's really bloomed into a real conversation amongst all of our theater professionals uh, theater goers, uh, you know, theater administrators, board members, like everybody tunes in to watch us. And we've been having some really um, heartfelt conversations. It kind of, it, it, my, my metaphor, I used that when I was a kid and Soul Train was on, on Saturday mornings, that was like the only place where you could tune in and see commercials with black people doing everything that everybody else did. <laughs> so, like, so like Saturday morning from 11 to 12, I knew I was going to see a bunch of black people in McDonald's at the same time or a bunch of black people in the supermarket at the same time and black hair care products. And it felt like natural and real. And, right. and I think that's what we have now with these conversations. I think we're having conversations that are real and that are honest to, you know, our fellow workers and our, our fellow, you know, our, our, some of our patrons, you know, some of our board members. And so, um, you know, I, I want to kind of start it with, you know, Nikki, me and you met in 2012 at the Tessitura Conference. And yep. that was my first national theater conference of any type. And like out of 1300 people, there was me, you, and probably three other black people. True and, story. And, and that's when I realized like, oh, there's not a lot of us in this thing. I, and I had no idea why. Um, and I guess I'll, I'll, I'll kind of start there and, you know, and with you also, Mark, what, what has been, I guess going back to that point is where I frame the starting point of our conversation and just going back, what has been your experience, Nikki, as being like I say of this melanated hue in this industry, which a lot of people don't know has been, you know, is predominantly, you know, is, is white dominated, like in almost every aspect and has been. A lot of people don't realize that, but it is. What have been your experiences and observations, you know, or in your career or things that have stuck out to you as you've come on this path? Well, um, I started my uh, career in the arts working for the Lyric Opera of Chicago. And, you know, it was very rare to see Black people who worked in that medium um, unless they were performing on stage. So um, I know that when people would ask me, you know, well, where do you work? And I would tell them there would be this shock look, like shock and awe. And you're just like, yeah, we're there. And I wanted to also mention that I had a wonderful boss who made a point of hiring a diverse staff. We had people from all walks of life. We had people with disabilities, um, different you know, economic backgrounds, and it was beautiful. And it really uh, has instilled in me how important it is to have diversity in all aspects of life uh, and when doing staffing to make sure that you are inclusive. Uh, obviously, my road has not been the easiest in the sense that I was working in predominantly white spaces. So called out often about my hair and um, people just looking at me a bit strange and constantly 
and even to this day, questioning my knowledge and qualifications for what I do. But to me, it was important to give 110% because I knew I was representing. And I really, really wanted to bust that door down so there would be others following behind me. So I knew I had to come in and bring it. That's right. That's right. How about how about how about you, Mark, along the same lines? What were the, the early things or things that you've seen among your way that kind of stuck out to you? Well, I think that when I when I started my career, well, even going back to college, when I was I went to Rutgers, went to Mason Girls School of the Arts, and even in my stage management program, there there was only one other black person in the stage management program um, when I was there. I was in the undergrad program. She was in the grad program. Um, and she is still one of my closest um, theater friends and one of my mentors. Uh, shout out to Nicole Leonard. Um, so, you know, as I started my professional career, it didn't shock me to not see as many chocolate people working in theater because, you know, through high school, through college, that's what I knew. But then I got, I started my theater career working at Crossroads Theater Company in New Brunswick, New Jersey. And talk about walking into culture shock where every single person in the theater was black. Okay, there were a handful of white folks, um, but the majority of chocolate, chocolate folks, and it was like a love fest. Um, and it, it was a totally different vibe working at Crossroads than any other theater I've worked in. Um, I've worked in some theater companies that were very diverse. I've worked in places where I was a visiting stage manager and I was like one of three black people in the room with a 70 person staff. So um, it kinda, I kind of ran the gamut. Um, Mark, to that, would you mind talking a little bit what the difference of that experience was the first time being at Crossroads and and because I, we'll talk a lot about how a lot of times in these institutions, in these positions, we are the, the only or one of very, very few. Um, can you just talk a little bit about what that experience was like or the difference of the experience of being in a group of folks who looked like you versus people who wondered what you were doing there because of what you looked like? Right. I, I, the being at Crossroads, it was like you were at home with your family. So, you know, we were all making incredible, and when I say incredible uh, work, um, and we just rolled together like a family. So like you heard one, you heard us all. Um, you know, we hung out before shows, after shows, show was over, we all rolled to the bar on weekends. And it was like, it wasn't just like the production folks and the artistic folks were separate, the development. When we hung out as a company, there, everyone was there from the artistic director to the development director and all down the line at all different levels. Um, and when you, when I moved on and worked at other theaters, you know, you get your clicks and it's like, you've got your development click and you've got your marketing clicks. And then you've got your production folks who are the bottom of the totem pole. But at Crossroads, it was like, people knew that every single person, whether you were the artistic director and I'm really not comparing and putting A, A to Z, but if you go from the artistic director to, you know, the custodian, everybody was the same. We understood that everyone had a crucial role in bringing art to life. Um, and everybody was just playing a role. Um, and you, you don't get that very often. Um, and I didn't have, I didn't experience it often after that. Um, when I, after I left Crossroads, I, I had the great opportunity of working for the Boys Choir of Harlem and traveled with them for about seven or eight years as their assistant stage manager, the assistant um, tour manager and their stage manager. And that experience was fun because when you roll into, when you roll into a city down South with a bus full of 50 or 60 black kids, a five person black band and with some black teachers and alums and you roll in 90 deep with black folks, people are like, what the is going on? Is there an invasion? you know, until, you know, they come in and see the performance. And like, ah, got it, got it, got it, got it. Um, Mark, if you were on that tour, 
in the mid 90s in the 94 to 96 range and you all toured Lawrence Kansas and played at the lead center I was there Girl, yes. That's why I love this world. That's why I love this small world. I ha I still have a picture in my little scrapbook of me and all these little boys and their or the boys choir of Harlem. Yes, yes. Yes. That's all right. So see, I feel connected to you now, Mark, in a whole other way. It was a Yay! and I tell people even when I go it, to, up to my current job that I hold now in every job interview I've ever had, people were like, what's the best professional experience you've ever had in your life? And I always say the Boys Square for long. I mean, to get to travel the world as a black man, A, on someone else's dime, to get to do what I love, get to listen to great music, um, meet VIPs and presidents. And, you know, it, it, was, a, it was the best experience ever. Um, it was probably the most challenging time for me professionally when I was younger and I had a lot less patience than I do now. Um, and especially when we toured in the South. Um, but I tell you that story some other time. With the, I'll tell you a quick story about traveling in the South. Um, when I had to school, so we were in a college and I had to school some kid because, you know, I could tell we were gonna have a problem with the kid because he comes in, he's wearing his Confederate flag on his shirt you know, the Confederate flag tattoo. I'm like, oh, Jesus, I'm not up for this today. Keep me near the cross. Um, and then, you know, the, all this, the kids came in and they're rehearsing. And then all of a sudden, like there's a quiet lull on stage. And then all of a sudden you hear this dick from backstage yelling, oh, come on guys, it's time to hang the blacks. So now granted, understand he was talking about curtains, but he knew exactly what he yeah. was doing. So that became a teaching moment for me to explain to these kids, like, you know, the ignorant people still call borders and legs blacks. Right. Uh, well, I won't say the ignorant people, but the ignorant people trying to make an ignorant point. Right. So while after rehearsal ended, I went up to the production manager and I said, well, we're going to have one tiny little change to your staffing, your staff. And that gentleman there with that shirt if he is backstage, when we come out for places, we will not go on stage. So you deal with it however you need to deal with it, but I don't want to see him here for the rest of the night. So he got his walking papers and went on his way and the students got a good, uh, a good lesson about stupidity. Wow. Hey, Mark, I want to, I want to, I want to, I want to dovetail off of that and bring this around to Nikki. Um, Cause me and Nikki both, you know, we we both been doing this box office thing for a long time. Before I started doing development, we've been doing that on the selling the selling the ticket side. But I want to ask you, Mark. You know, I, I I really got my start in theater with my dad working over at the Spreckles Theater. He's been head of security at the Spreckles Theater for like forty plus years. So when I was a you know teenager in high school and I needed some extra bucks, he would let me come work a couple security shifts. And you know from you know, from the mid 80s into the 90s, you know, I was seeing what was, you know, the predecessor to Tyler Perry. I was seeing the Shelly Garrett shows on tour come through, you know, the, the early beauty shops. And, you know, I remember as a kid seeing the Wiz come through when Cher Cheryl Pepsi Riley was, was in it. You know what I mean? And I, I, but I also got to realize and notice the difference in how the, production and management of those shows were treated touring and coming to town versus other shows. And I want to get this over to Nikki, you know, in a second about how that, you know, how that goes into how we sell tickets and dealing with marketing to black shows that are supposed to only be sold to black audiences and what the expectations are. But can you tell me, you know, what, if there were any noticeable differences for you in traveling and doing that touring and bringing a predominantly black show to different cities? Like, was there a different treatment, not by the audiences, but by the staff of oh, venues? Absolutely. I could, I could name one, I have one great story. Um, we were, we were actually in Philly and this was probably in 96, 97. And I won't mention what theater we were at, but we were at a large theater and it was a concert venue and we were doing a fundraiser. And um, 
you know, our tech writer is pretty specific about the things that we need because we're not like the high school choir from down the street. These kids have traveled internationally and sung for kings and queens and, you know, they need the shit that they need. So on the rider, it asks for a properly tuned nine foot Steinway. So we get there for rehearsal. Uh, well, I get there early with the crew to set up and do all, set all the lights and sound. And this guy rolls out this like six foot baby grand piano I'm like, um, sir, that's not a grand piano. And he was like, well, we don't, the grand piano is not available. And I'm like, well, I have this contract here that says the grand piano should be available. So someone needs to make it available. And he was like, well, uh, you know, I'll go talk to my boss. I'm like, all right. I said, I am forewarning you right now. And this is at 10 o'clock in the morning. I said, I am the nicest person you're going to deal with today. If that Steinway is not on the stage and properly tuned by the time Walter Turnbull walks in the door, there will be hell to pay. He sung his song and he did what he needed to do. And then at two o'clock when Walter walked in the door and that baby Stein, that baby grand was still on the stage. And it, and it wasn't so bad that it was a baby grand, but it was a baby grand that had not been tuned and clearly hadn't been tuned. So he went, we went through rehearsal and the kids do like a two hour rehearsal and then we're done. And he was like, I want to talk to the head of production. So I get the guy. He was like, look, he goes, I know that my person has asked you like 10 times for a piano that we were promised by contract. And he was like, oh, oh, you know, it, it's not available. He was like, oh, okay. It's not available. Fine. So show starts. He tells our, so the, if you've never seen the Boys Choir of Harlem show, the first half of the show is all classical music and spirituals. Second half is pop jazz Broadway section. So during this classical section, he instructs the, the classical pianist. He was like, every time you have to hit those three keys that are super out of tune, I want you to clank it. So, I mean, it was so, and every time he would do it, the conductor would go like this and he'd go, ooh. And by like the third song, the production manager was backstage like, you need to tell them to stop this. This is not funny. I was like, bitch, I told you four hours ago we came to the show, this was not acceptable. And now this is what you get. <laughs> Lo and behold, we got to intermission. Everyone went to their dressing room. The, the, the um, promoter of the concert came backstage and apologized. And I come back out five minutes later and there's a nine foot perfectly tuned Steinway on stage. Look at that. You know, if I'd rolled in there with the Vienna Boys Choir, there had been no question. There would have been a nine foot Steinway sitting on stage from the moment we walked in the door. And that's just, you know, it's annoying when you have to play those games because there's so many other things I would have preferred to be doing than arguing with you about something that's in my contract. Right, right. Right. Hey, Nikki, over, over the years, you know, when we're selling tickets and, and, you know, when we would have to deal with marketing and, and whoever else about how we're going to sell tickets or what the audience is going to be or how to expect them to be sold, um, what stands out in your experience, if any, in differences, how a, a so-called Black show or Black performance is coming in, how that's treated differently in marketing or getting the audience to whatever, any other show that usually comes through. If this is a so-called Black production or a show that should be marketed to, you know, is there anything that sticks out in your mind and how there were differences and how those things were approached? Well, I think that let's look at this in a little different way. Yeah. I, I am offended whenever we have to uh, focus on a specific ethnic group for a specific production. I find it also offensive to ask me as a person of color to, or as a black woman, let's, let me stop being PC to, um, who do you know? Who should we be going to? Look, <laughs> you know, come on. What you need to be looking at is why are these people coming into our doors all the time? In many cases, it can be what's on our stage. It can be the way they're treated when they come to our facility or things that are beyond their control, location. That's why it's so important for us to take arts to the communities. That's right. And I want to follow up on that with you, Nikki, because as you said, you have worked in Chicago, San Diego, you're now in Princeton, New Jersey, you've worked in opera and in uh, traditional theater. 
as you mentioned, predominantly white institutions uh, mm -hmm. throughout that. Has there been a difference for you regionally? I mean, just across any of that, it, have, have you felt a, 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 a difference in the way that things are approached or has it kind of been what well, it was across the board? Okay, so every, every uh, region is different, right? I mean, California is very much free to be you and me. So people seem to be a little more accepting of, you know, somebody who looks unique or dresses differently. Here on the East Coast, um, let's just say they like to put people in boxes. Now, you all know me, I don't fit in anybody's box. <laughs> so obviously, uh, fitting in and creating a network has been very difficult because, you know, what you see is not necessarily how I align, right? My interests are all across the board. A, a fascinating conversation that I had with a colleague and talking about programming things, uh, we, you know, at McCarter, we do a lot of presented work as well, along with work that we personally produce. So, we have a lot of one night shows. And so in speaking with my colleague about, you know, I said, hey, so when are you gonna bring in things that I would like? Now, that's <laughs> kind of a loaded question sure. because what does he turn around and say to me? What, you mean rap hip hop? Mm. Now, I like all genres of music. <laughs> and so therefore, Miss Nikki was kind of like, uh. No, that wasn't exactly where I was going. And looking at the numbers, opera seems to sell really well here. Maybe we should bring in more of that, right? Because in the end, it's all about the data. And I do love opera. <laughs> <laughs> I'm noticing the Donna Summer up on your wall, just, just uh, outside of the view. Very That's eclectic, really I love true. it. Um, I have learned so much from every place that I've worked that, you know, I look at it as a blessing. I, I never thought this would be my career. Keep in mind, um, when I said I wanted to work in arts and entertainment, I wanted to be a makeup artist because that's who I am. That's what I do. <laughs> Ticketing was a way to get into an institution. It wasn't necessarily supposed to be the end game, but it turned around that I was damn good at it. And I had all these other skills because I worked in uh, corporate America as well. So if I didn't have that balance of both sides, I don't think I would be in the position I'm in now. Yes. And well, by the yeah. way, I am a makeup artist. I am a union makeup artist and I am proud of that. <laughs> Get that side hustle. <laughs> that, right? Well, the thing too is the union I belong to is so hard to get into and has always been traditionally white. So the fact that I got that union card every day, I kiss it. I send my dues happily. <laughs> That's right. That's right. You know, again, like, like I said, I, this is, this is kind of like an administrative, you know, episode because, you know, the current positions we all inhabit right now. But kind of sticking along, you know, the the kind of the patron experience, you know, I, I want to talk about a little bit about, you know, any differences, especially with you, Nikki, and every, you know, in the different places that you've been and having to deal so much with ticketing that has to work so much in hand in hand with house management and with you, Mark, being a director of operations, knowing you have to keep your eye on that as well. What kind of things stick out to you as far as, and, and we always try to frame these not just for what we're looking for, you know, to say what needs to change within the industry from the institution standpoint, but we're also looking at what needs to change from, you know, the patron standpoint, as far as us and our folks going to the theater and as far as us, you know, being artists in the theater, you know, that's what these conversations are for as well. What hmm. are any takeaways that you have? And I'll, and I'll go to you on this one first, Mark. What kind of or any takeaways you have on things observations you have from the house side of things as far as versus different types of audiences and the reason i ask these questions is people don't understand these are 
these are things that are said. These are conversations that are had. Like, you know, how are we going to treat this audience when they come in? How are we going to treat these folks when they come in the door? You know, give me a little bit of anything you have on that. So, so I'll tell you that the, that my entire career, with the exception of the role that I had at McCarter, um, um, was always backstage. Um, so when I was hired at McCarter, I was uh, running the front of house operation for the first time. And there is a reason that they keep me backstage um, because I have I have no um, I have no uh, fake face, no fake emotions. <laughs> Um, I, I need to buy count to 10 because I don't want to tell this probably hundred thousand dollar donor to go ask himself. Um, it is, I have seen, so, and this isn't this, so this isn't necessarily about McCarter. Um, my, my one, I will say the one th experience I had at McCarter that I, um, that I look back upon and said, I am glad by the grace of God, I did not reach out and touch this man. Um, <laughs> was during, um, McCarter does a Christmas Carol every year and they do an incredible production of it. Um, for everything from the casting, the sets, um, the tech, it's just an incredible production. And, you know, they do a very um, non-traditional cast of A Christmas Carol. And we, you know, we, they, we get patron surveys. And one day I just sat and I'm, I'm reading the surveys and I'm reading um, this patron's response about how, how we had just gone way above and beyond. We, what we were doing was ridiculous and that there was no way that Tiny Tim could have, you know, a, a black mother and a white father and be Asian. I honestly can't remember what the casting was, but it was something of that nature. And I'm thinking, well, there are fucking ghosts, excuse my French, there are ghosts and goblins flying around. So that's <laughs> more believable than the fact that a black woman and a white man can't have this Asian child. It was the weirdest thing. But during one performance in particular, uh, you know, we were, we were running late and we were doing some late seating and this man dropped something and he looked at me and he said, hey boy, can you help me get that? And it took me a second and I was like, did he just call me boy? And everyone around him clearly acknowledged the fact that he called me boy and they all responded for me. I literally just turned to my, the volunteer that worked there that was next to me was like, I'll take care of this, you should go. I said, you're right, I'm just gonna go. <laughs> I'm gonna go and close the door so we can start the show. Um, because if I was not prayed up that day, it would have been a totally different response. And we, you know, we might have thrown some hands at some 70 year old man. <laughs> but then in hindsight, when I look back, I'm like, and while I don't give him, give him a pass at all, you know, he is of that generation of, you know, that is, that might be his acceptable way to refer to a black person. Um, or a young black person. I'm like, sir, don't let the baby face fool you. I am not 25 and I'll lay your ass out. <laughs> but I need my job and my health insurance. So I'm just going to go back to my office. <laughs> I do want to jump in there. And so sorry, I cut out for a minute. It might keep happening. It happens once or twice an episode. We go with it. Um, but we do talk on this show a lot about bad beings and to correct that sort of bad behavior. And because those types of things are still happening in some form or another, this still happens to our black ushers, our black house staff. Uh, I, I, I have a follow-up question that I wanna go to because of the things that the patron services folks have to hear when people are calling to complain. These things are still happening. And like you said, you could not, You have, good thing you were filled up a prayer of that you good thing you were paired up that day reaction might have cost you your job if you weren't that is very obviously true. we still need to work but we also need to correct these behaviors and so to me i in my head i'm going oh that's a teachable moment sir we don't do but again in the moment you don't have so what is the ideal and i'm talking ideal grand scheme of the world what is the way that we would respond to that patron who, who in this case, like you said, he might've thought that that was the right way to speak to a black person. If, 
if if I were if I were in a different state of mind and I wasn't rushing to get the house so we could start a show, um, I, my my real response would have been, "Sir, my name is Mr. Mark Sharp. Um, if you need some help, just let me know." Um, I, you know, but I it, it was one of those things that I just chose not to pick the battle then, which probably let him win. But at the end of the day, you know, I, I just needed to get the show started. And I don't even mean what's your responsibility. What is the grand responsibility? Sorry, go ahead. No, I was going to say that I've been in the situation that Mark is describing numerous times. I am always a girl. Um, and, you know, people are extremely disrespectful. And I always come back saying, hi, my name is Nikki. How can I help you? You know, I, I know that it's part of my disposition to continue to try to take the high road. I am beyond trying to teach others how to behave. That's not my job. And I don't want to be put in that position. I remember, uh, I remember when I, you know, started being a manager at the box office here at the rep. And I remember the times when I would go stand in the lobby, just to see how the house was coming in, see what's going on, you know, see if the house manager needed any help, check what's going on. And it never missed a beat that I was a security guard. I was a security guard walking through the lobby. That's who I was, who I had to be. There was no other capacity that I could have in walking through the lobby. But to go off like your experience, Mark, I have the real extreme of that is when I worked at the Spreckles and you know, at that time I was um I was on site maintenance for all the performances. And I remember there was a patron who was being very disruptive upstairs in the in the mezzanine. And uh, you know, and I, I kind of went up to just kind of, you know, see what was going on. And when security was asking to leave and he came out, I was automatically the nigger. Oh, you went and got the big nigger. You went and got the big nigga. What are you going to do, nigga? What are you going to do? And, you know, people don't understand the strength that it takes to, number one, just on a personal level, not react to that, to on a professional level, not react to that. And this just, this was all the way down the mezzanine stairs into the lobby out to the sidewalk with his wife pleading for him to shut up and pleading for me to forgive him he's dr i don't want to hear he's drunk i don't want to hear all that i don't want to hear all that but you know it's like you're saying it's that behavior and you know to have the restraint that's that you know people let might take that as in like oh he's calling the security card a jerk or so calling this guy something no this is someone who's really who's really trying to use the basest thing they can find to for whatever reason tempt you to lose your job tempt you to lose your way of living tempt you to lose your cool to prove them right mm -hmm. you know and um you know, that kind of leads into my next thing that I want to kind of flip because we were, we were, before we came on, we were talking a little bit about clothing, especially with me and you, Mark, being, being big men, you right. know, and I want to flip this and I, you know, I, I want to flip this and, and to you, Mark, with your size. And then I want to take it to, you know, Jacole and Nikki, as far as being women and black women, you know, what are the types of, uh, you know, I talked about a little bit is that I, I'm I, obviously I got to be the security guard. Obviously, I have to be the maintenance guy. There's no other reason for me to be lurking around the lobby for, you know, you know, what kind of things have you run into that like, Mark, that have, have you know, especially being because men of men who look like us in our size for many years, we were like the absolute unicorn in this industry, especially me on the administrative side. There's like, we just don't, we just, we're not supposed to be in this space. We're just not. <laughs> I think part, I, I think a long time ago, I, I discovered that, um, since I, I work hard to hide my anger management issue, 
Um, when I don't, when I don't, I look different and I come off differently when I wear contact lenses than when I put on my glasses and someone says, oh, he's a smart Negro. <laughs> I put on my smart Negro glasses um, and I walk around. And when people are like, um, who's in charge? I'm like, I'm in charge. Well, well, can I speak to your supervisor? I'm like, well, if you want to drive to her house 40 miles away, sure. But otherwise, um, what's the issue? Um, I, I do get that often that people are shocked when someone says, well, I, I want to, as in my current position, um, when people go to my house manager and they have issues, they're like, well, I want to speak to your supervisor. And they're like, well, there he is right there. And I've been sitting listening to the whole conversation. I'm like, ma'am, I will gladly, well, number one, you need to tone it down like about four, four notches, and we can gladly talk about your concerns. Um, but I think that she has already addressed your concerns and explained to you that, you know, you showed up 10 minutes late, there is a late seating queue and you have missed it. So now you have to sit and watch it on the monitor for the next 15 minutes till you can go to your seat. Like, I don't know what else to tell you other than <laughs> um, I didn't say that the angel on my shoulder was like Mark don't say that it's not kind this is why they keep me in the office and they don't let me work for <laughs> there's a reason for this and I appreciate it <laughs> well, I, 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 I do I do want to take the ball um, and thank you for, for setting it up because I'm sitting here looking at this screen and I'm like we got two big bald brag brothers on the screen and then we got two curly haired like just do what you do kind of girls on the screen but nikki i want it so i feel like our experience may be less mistaken identity or uh you aren't who the, the, the that the men get that uh mark and ahmed have been talking about for me what i felt and especially as a curly haired woman, but I know that you feel it in other ways as well. The liberties that people feel like they can take with our hair and our bodies, the amount of coworkers or board members or just people in general, but especially our co co let's even say colleagues that think it's okay just to touch your hair because it looks different. Or can, can you talk about some of the liberties that people feel that it's okay to take with you. Yeah, people do not respect my personal space in any form. They all wanna touch me, whether it's rubbing my arm because I got a big old tattoo, right? So like other people don't have tattoos, skin to skin, but they all feel like they gotta rub it or touch my hair or touch my face or, um, it's just completely inappropriate. And I honestly do get mistaken. Um, numerous times because whenever I'm in the ladies room and they have multiple stalls I always hate getting that wet line across my waist <laughs> because people refuse to wipe down the counter <laughs> I'm wiping it down because you know that's just who I am and all of a sudden they're looking at me like I'm custodial no 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 I just wasn't raised in a cave so <laughs> It, I mean, it, it is utterly ridiculous. And because I deal with so many different demographics, whether it's our patrons, donors, board members, whatever, I also have to deal with a lot of sexual harassment. And I know it stems from the fact that I am a shorter statured human. And so that gives people this feeling that they can dominate me in some way. But this short black woman has a big mouth when she needs to, <laughs> right? So, you know, it's frustrating. It's, there have been many nights that I've come home and cried. Um, it's, it's very challenging in, uh, you know, the job that I do. Yeah. Also, uh, because of the way that I speak, people will talk to me on the phone and then when they come to the theater and <laughs> they meet me, the shock and awe. <laughs> okay? Nikki, yes, I am a black well. woman with a fro. You speak so well, Nikki. 
So articulate, all of you on this call, so articulate. I, I will say that my level of mistaken identity, I think that everything about me screams artistic. And so people <laughs> sort of know that that's the world that I live in, but I have had to train myself to keep a smile on my face, to, to have at least some part of this corners of my mouth turned up. Otherwise I'm, I'm perceived as, as angry or, or because I'm also, I am also a direct woman and with a little bit of a big mouth. And so I, I will speak, speak up. There was one instance and bless everybody's heart. Cause it was all out of respect, <laughs> especially y'all at the rep who have worked with me and Nikki, you've seen it too. One thing I cannot stand is over talking in a meeting or, or multiple happening at once. Y'all know, uh, anybody from the rep who's hearing it, they know me and, hey, one meeting. Can we have one meeting? And I had I had a moment like that at, at a place. I was in a mood. I was just in a place where I needed efficiency in this meeting. And I maybe had my aggressive voice on and I did. I was like, hey, guys, can we have one meeting? And people kind of hopped to, okay, yeah, no. And, and the meeting got focused. I'm going to say it was more than a week. A couple weeks later, I actually, I had a coworker who came up to me just to make sure we were cool. Like, I just want to make sure I felt that you were really angry at me in that meeting because I was the one that was talking and, and I just want to make sure we're okay. Well, one, I can't tell you who was talking. I don't know. I don't care. There was just too many people talking. Like that wasn't directed at anybody, but just this perception of just this anger that I must have been just holding on to for weeks and weeks and weeks because somebody interrupted me in a meeting. No, that shit was gone the second I, as soon as everybody quieted down, I was fine. Amen. But just, the, it's this perception of anger and carrying that with you. And I'm one of the most jovial people that I know. And it still shocks me that I am perceived as an angry black woman because I'm tall, because I've got a little bit of melanin and because I've got some depth to my voice. I am perceived in a very specific way. So I'd say that's my version of mistaken identity. And that's, that's real because, you know, I've, ever since I've been a kid, I have a stone face. If I'm not laughing, if there's not something that's making me laugh at that moment, if there's not, you know, I, I just, my face, I could be in the greatest mood ever. My face is just stone. It doesn't, it's not, I'm not mad at you. I'm not, it's just, that's just, that's just my resting male bitch face, I guess. I guess that's what it is, right? <laughs> but, um, but to go to your point, though, because of the package I'm in, if I'm in a meeting or if I'm, if I'm in a room and I go to emphasize something, you know, if I go to put emphasis on something or my voice raises a little bit, it probably raised the same amount or maybe not as much as the guy over here and as this woman over here. But because I'm in this passion, because my voice is what it is, if it does, oh, is he good? Is he, is he going to hulk out? Is he, is he about to... <clears throat> Is he about to tear the room apart? It's like, no, nah, I just got excited for a sec, but I'm cool. I just was trying to get you to, I was just trying to put an exclamation point on it. You know what I mean? But these things are real. Like people don't understand that these things are real. And it's just like you're saying, Jacole, a week later, somebody had to, somebody was carrying that moment around for a week. Like I know that moment. That's like, hey, there's one meeting. Everybody be quiet. Hey, hey, y'all, can, can we? But someone carried that for a week. And was trying to figure out how to talk to you about it. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. and, that, and that is because of that, that anger. Like my sister deals with it on her job. My brothers had to deal. Like, this is the thing. Like, that angry black person. It's just, and these are, you know, these are those stereotypes that get ingrained. And in, in our space, you know, I think the, the, the thing that is, you know, for us, you know, for people who are talk, listening right now, as we're talking about just going around the office, you know, this is throughout all industries. This is through every office space that there is, you know. Um, I want to touch on something with all you guys from everybody's different experience here as a conversation that's kind of the last couple of weeks has turned to this, this way is the conversation of the pipeline, the pipeline into theater. The pipeline, and you know, of course, the, the conversation has been dominated over the pipeline of what happens on stage and directors and writers. But here we are as administrators, and we understand that these are jobs that we do that can be done across the spectrum. You know, especially for me, 
you know, I, 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 I got into this. I really stayed into this because I started work. Like you're saying, Nikki, I started working. In the, I just needed a gig. I needed a job. I got a part-time job here at the rep selling tickets. I'm a geek. I started reading manuals that were locked in the closet and I became a tech head. You know what I mean? And so now I'm like, you know, I'm, I'm a tech head. But at the same time, you know, we're talking about the pipeline and the, 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 the talk has been towards internships. And sometimes when you talk talking about internships, you kind of tell people, well, we kind of need to do away with internships. They kind of look at you as like, you're like, what, you don't want to give kids a chance? It's like, no, I do want to give kids a chance. I want to give the kids who can't afford to take an internship, the kids who are apt for theater or for administration in this, I want to give them a chance to be able to get in here because they can't afford to do it for free. So I'd rather have them come in here and learn theater that they want to do and get paid to do it versus having to go work at McDonald's. And, you know, so I want to get everybody's thoughts on what you think about that as far as, and I think this is something that's really starting to gain steam now as we're talking about equity, as we're talking about the pipeline, as we're talking about diversity, and we're looking at all the different things that are keeping that down. I think that's one of the most important and maybe overlooked things. Uh, Nikki, do you have any thoughts on that as far as like, you know, trying to bring younger people in to work in the house staff and in the box office and on the development staff? Well, okay. So I have been fortunate that most of my career I've been in a supervisory position. So I am all about hiring people who I feel are going to work together as a unit. And, you know, we know the Tessie can be a little difficult. So you do have to have a, an aptitude for computers. Mm -hmm. I, but I'm really focused on mentorship. It's something I have done throughout my entire career. And I believe in it. I would not be where I am without that. Whether it's been professional or personal, mentors are so important. And what upsets me now, see, I'm getting ready to talk about our people right now. So, Grace. <laughs> Let's do it. Let's do it. What upsets me is when I looked out for a mentor and I would approach other people who were like me, who were Black or a person of color, zero response, zero wanting to help. The people who have helped me and who have been mentors for me have been white people. And I want to drive that home. Because, you know, right now, everybody's like, oh, all oh, white theaters, it's the bad thing. There are lots of allies out there who want to lift us up. But we, once we get to a position, it is our job, our duty to help lift others up. And, you know, I get it. There's this small slice in the pie. I'm willing to share my slice. I'm not worried. Yeah. We have got to, as a community, help each other and lift each other up. Yes. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think, you know, the time I took away from, the time I stepped away from the rep and I went to work for Tessitura, you know, and that was, that, I mean, that's just basically going to work for a software company. And, you know, I think that's where those thoughts became solidified even more because it became that, now I was working for this software company that was serving for, serving as the backbone for many performing arts. And I think people need to understand that not just performing arts, but in, in the jobs that we do in, in, in the industry, and that includes museums, that includes theme parks. They deal with the same type of relationships. Theme parks have memberships. They have performers. They have like, it's the, it's the same type of, you know, it's the same type of administration. It's the same type of revenue flow. And, you know, at the same time, I think that's when it became more crystal clear that it was like, yeah, like there's not a lot of us in here because of not a lot of us are really reaching out to let each other know that we could be in here. And but also, you no, know, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you no, off. No, you're good. You're good. But also, I think that what we do, Ahmed, is not sexy. Most people, when they come into the industry, they all want to be, you know, the top dog or they want to be on yeah. the creative side or, yeah. you know, they want to act or whatever. It's very few people that say, yeah, I want to run a box office. Yeah, I want to I I I I process donations all day. Okay. <laughs> but I get personal fulfillment.
fulfillment from what I do because I look at the joy that it brings to others. There is nothing more beautiful than having a sold out house and know you are a part of making that happen or watching people come into the theater and they're holding hands and you know it's date night and hey, you're a part of that. It's a beautiful thing. It is, it is, it is. How about you, Mark? Do you have any, any, any thoughts on that? I do. I, I, I'm actually ashamed to say that I am, I have been the, the beneficiary of incredible black mentors, um, my entire life. Um, some uh, Curtis Hodge and Nicole Leonard, if you're listening, my two first mentors out of college who to this day are, you know, some of my biggest cheerleaders and help me process things and help me make make sure that I'm making the right decisions for my career. Um, but I have not, especially in the last two or three years, I have not made the time to give back and mentor other people. But I will say that I did take a, a, leave, a leave of absence for about a decade from the arts and I worked at Rutgers University in student affairs. So I feel like I gave back in my helping to raise other people's badass kids. <laughs> Um, help them find their right, right path. Um, but coming back to the theater world, and especially at NBPAC, like we, I literally started there like seven months before the, before, uh, so the building is literally nine months, or just actually, I'm lying, we just celebrated our one year anniversary. So the building is brand spanking new, and I started in April, the building opened in September, so I maybe had like four days between April and September to breathe. Um, so I have not done a lot of work with outreach and, and um, bringing in students to mentor and more, stu more people like us that, especially in our, in our production department, because there are, there are maybe two people of color that I see there on a regular basis. And when we have larger calls, you know, and there aren't many much, there aren't many more. Um, and I also don't see anyone, you know, I luckily get to hire most of the staff at the, the Performing Arts Center. And we have a very small tight knit staff and it's pretty diverse, but we need some, we need some more folks of color working in on the production end. Um, so they understand that there is a, there is something else to do other than being on stage, acting, singing, directing, like you can have a career on the production side. Agreed. And those, and those skills are, are transferable. Right, exactly, exactly. Well, and I just wanna add that mentorship, it look in so many different ways because I'm a little bit of a combination of the two of you. I absolutely, I, I've been the only one in all of the institutions that I've been in or the departments that I've been in. I'm the only one at the Playhouse now that Nikki left, thank you. Hey, I, I paved the way for you, don't hate. You did, you did. And we, we've talked about this and, and, and I have so, we could talk for an hour. I have another hour. I have so many different like questions and tangents in my head. Uh, but the, well, thanks, thanks but for I'll letting go to. Thanks for letting her go because the East Coast loves her. <laughs> I, I, no, Mark, we, you love me. <laughs> I was going to say I gave her up willingly, but she can tell you I didn't. <laughs> um, but, um, you know, I, so the two things that I want to say are one, mentorship looks like anything. I, I like Nikki, the people who have sort of rose me up in my career and provided opportunities and opened doors for me have been white folks. And I'm very grateful for the doors that have been opened. But because I have this position, I have a responsibility for the people who were come because now there is somebody in that position and I can raise people up with me. And mentorship doesn't have to be full on taking somebody under your wing and meeting with them once a week and making sure they're good. Mentorship can be, if they reach out, reach back. If they have yes. a question, answer. If you can tell there's a question in there, they're not answering my, or they're not asking mine for it. There was a young man who was an intern of ours and he he sent me his resume. He said, Nicole, I'm uh, this, I'm, applying for the biggest job of my life. Would you mind just please taking a look at my resume and and just, and helping me out? Bless his heart. Like his resume was a mess. He had a lot of good information on there, but as a professional, I'm like, ah, I don't know what to do. And I started to just like Mario, like here, here's, here's some tips and things. But you know what? 
here's what we're going to do. And I created a, a workable resume for this kid. It probably took me an hour to do all the things. And I was cussing the whole time and like, ah, mother, I shouldn't even be having to do this. No. But it felt so good to present this the resume of his information. He provided all the information, but that now looks like a professional. And he wrote me back. He's like, Nicole, I feel so confident going into this. I feel so yeah. confident sending this in because you, we took, because I took a moment, you know, and it, an hour out of our day, come on. What, how much hours do you waste in a week to take a little bit of a time just to answer somebody's question, help them out? That is mentorship. It doesn't have to be it doesn't have to be big brothers and big sisters. It can be answering a question. Yeah. Yeah. And I think in my role, I mean, my goal has always been if I get hit by a bus, this place still has to run. So I have always tried to make sure that I train the staff extremely well. And so it can run like a machine. My understanding is that Pearl is knocking it out the park for you guys at LJT. And yeah. so, Girl's so happy, so proud of her. But I, 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 I live for that. I live to see people move up, move on, whatever. Right? Yeah. Yeah, and I think that's, I think that's a big part of, you know, you know, I, I try to, in what I do now, like this has been now, I'm coming up on a year being in philanthropy, like my whole time before, you know, I was dealing with ticketing and IT. And, you know, I'm trying to live by the motto of, you know, measure, measure 12 times, cut once, you know, and that takes time, you know, and I'm trying to hope that people understand that I'm learning something new and I'm trying to master something new, but I'm also trying to do what I'm learning this new, trying to do the same thing I did with the box office and IT. I'm trying, just like you said, Nikki, I'm trying to leave <coughs> run if I'm gone, that the next person can just take and plug and play and put yep. their own thing on it and go. If someone comes under me, I want to be able to say like, hey, here's this. Here's how you run it. Here's how you do it. Put your own spin on it. I'm gone. You know what I mean? And I think, you know, I've really been blessed. I've really been blessed here at the rep because, you know, Larry has, you know, we talk about mentorship and when it comes, came to the buy, like, you know, Larry started as managing director here at the same time I started working here. And we kind of grew together learning this ticketing stuff. And Larry, with his, you know, expertise in engineering, as you know, he mentored me in this tech thing. He mentored me in how to do this. You know what I mean? And it's just like Nicole is saying, now I'm at the point now to where, you know, we're having these discussions now. I want to bring not just, you know, of course, the priority for me is to bring you know, young black kids in because I'm the little black kid who came in and started from the ground up. So of course, you know, but even the people who are just disenfranchised, who don't have, didn't have this background or someone to bring them up in this, to be able to bring them up in this tech side, because I know it's transferable. And if they want to stay in the performing arts to take it that far, then you can, you can go wherever you want and do this thing. You know, if you want to take it and go to the Kennedy Center and do it and take it and go to the Kennedy Center and do it. You know, if you want to go wherever you want to go, if you want to go work for Alvin Ailey, go do it at Alvin Ailey. If you want to go do it, but then again, if you want to take it and go work at SeaWorld, go take it and work at SeaWorld, you know, whatever. But it's just like you guys are saying, you know, we want to be able to, um, we want to be able to hand these tools down because these are the tools that we lack you know, as a community for so long, you know, these are the things that we lack to be able to hand to one another, to, to be able to, you know, teach the next generation how to fish instead of just giving them fish, you know what I mean? So mm -hmm. I, it's just, you know, just going along with that whole, I, that all just comes along to this pipeline. Jacole helping this young man with the resume, that's pipelining because he didn't have that help from anywhere else. Yep. You know, that's her from her experience and what she's done through everything that she's done in his career, she's helping build a pipeline because now he knows how to do that and he's going to give it to somebody else in this industry. Well, and let's Although hope that in that particular case, in that particular case, I did not have the patience to teach that child. I just, I, I gave him a fish. But sometimes, sometimes you got to eat. Right. Um, I mean, I, 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 I am loving everything about this. I just wanted to give a little reminder that these folks 
folks are on the East Coast. I know, and I know. And near 10 o'clock where they're at. I know. I just looked at I just looked at the time. It was like, oh, 10 o'clock. 10 well, o'clock see, back there in New Jersey. Oh, that's the problem when we all get along so well. We can talk for hours. <laughs> <laughs> well, if there's anybody watching on Facebook or who is watching in, on uh, on Zoom, if you have a question, please submit it very quickly because I do want to let Mark and Nikki go. It's not Friday. It's Thursday. We all got to work tomorrow. Yeah, um, <laughs> but I, I guess what I'll do right now is as we um as we wrap this up, as I always do, you know, as we've been having this conversation, I want to give each of you a chance to tell everybody who's listening and who will be watching this afterwards. You know, what are your thoughts moving forward, industry wise, employee wise, artist wise, as we're like, I like, like I always say, everybody's made the statements, the statements are out there, the, you know, the, the Black Lives Matter statements, the equity statements, people are making the action plans, the blah, da, 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 it's all out there and everyone's doing it. But as we move forward in a realistic sense, you know, what do you guys see as far as the industry, what needs to happen with the industry moving forward? as far as equity and inclusion and what do you see as far as you know on the employee artist side moving forward you know in equity or what needs to happen moving forward in your opinion well i'll, I'll start i i think that you know with with the death of george floyd and everyone coming out with their statements of diversity and how they support support black art and black artists and black folks but it doesn't is not reflective in your staff or your board. Um, I think it's time for people to really take a, a, a deep look inside themselves and their administration and their staffing and really look at your statement, look at your reality, um, compare the two and make some changes. How about you? I agree. I also feel as though an inequity that needs to be address is with salaries. Traditionally, people of color have always made less. And we, it's not as though we're working less. And we, there needs to be some, it needs to be equitable across the board. Um, I don't want to hear the excuses about, oh, we don't have the money. Well, if you don't have the money, then you need to start lowering some people's salaries so we're still all at the same. <laughs> yes. Yes. How about you, Jacole? Any thoughts tonight on that question moving forward? I, mean, I know we're going to say it a lot, but... Like oh, you'll, you'll hear from me all the time. <laughs> Y'all you, you, will hear my thoughts more than you need to. But before we end, I just have to show, I found it. Six... Ah, oh, shit. I mean, shoot. I might have to take off my background for this. Six-year-old Jacole and the Boys Choir of Harlem. <laughs> hold on. We're do hold on. Hold on. I got to get rid of this virtual background for a second just so that we can see it. Oh this is God. Lawrence, Kansas, circa 1996, oh, wait, the wait, lead wait, center. Wait, 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 wait. You have to put that back up. I have to take okay. a picture of this. Um, <laughs> that is hilarious. So the, the gentleman on, on the left. Oh, my goodness. Uh, the gentleman on the left was the assistant head of counseling when I started working for the Boys Choir of Harlem. That is so hilarious. I'm going to send him this wow, picture. Wow. That is hilarious. It was one of the that my dad oh y'all are seeing behind the scenes sorry about that um it was we were in we were in lawrence kansas we had just moved my dad just got the job at the university of kansas i was going to lawrence high and that was one of the very first cultural events that he took me to in lawrence that is so that is so awesome such a small world <laughs> well, hey nikki and mark i know it's late but look thank you guys so much for joining us we would definitely want to have you guys back in the near future as this is going to be an ongoing thing. And, you know, this is going to be an ongoing conversation. And, you know, as we can tell, things things go by the hour in 2020. Things exactly. don't go by the month. They go by the hour. Stuff changes by the hour. I'm sure something done happened while we've been talking. So <laughs> All right. <laughs> but, hey, you guys, I, I really, I really appreciate you guys. Nikki, thank you for introducing us to Mark. Yes. Oh, my pleasure. <laughs> Thank you for having me. It's, it has really been a pleasure. Yeah, we, we, we appreciate it. And uh, you guys, again, thank you. And as we talked earlier and as we talked about in our tech rehearsal that I want everybody to know these conversations are out of love because we love what we do. We love this industry. 
We love what this industry has given us, what it's allowed us to express. We, we love what this industry can be. This is why we still continue this fight. This is why we still continue this fight for representation and equity because we know, like, we know the beauty among all cultures that can be expressed on these stages and in these performing arts centers. And, you know, so I just want to thank you guys. And I want to let everybody know who's listening. I forgot to mention this beforehand, but these conversations are available to watch on San Diego Repertory Theater and La Jolla Playhouse's YouTube pages. And these conversations are now available on San Diego Repertory Theater's SoundCloud page in podcast form. And you can search We Are Listening on Spotify. The first four episodes are up right now. We hope to have the rest of the episodes, including this one up by Monday or Tuesday. So if you haven't been able to watch all these, you can't always get the video, go to Spotify, search We Are Listening, and you can listen to all these great conversations that we've been having week after week. Again, Nikki, Mark, Jacole, thank all of you very much. I appreciate all y'all. Thank, thank you for the conversation. Thank all of you for listening. And uh, I'm going to let all y'all go so we can get to sleep. Because like I said, it ain't Thursday. It's Friday. We got work to do tomorrow. <laughs> Thank you all. All right. Good see y'all later. Have a good night.